You are listening to a Sustainable World Radio podcast. Sustainable World Radio brings you in-depth interviews, news, and commentary about positive solutions to environmental challenges. Solutions that adhere to the permaculture ethics of earth care, people care, fair share. Are you interested in learning more about permaculture projects around the globe? How to plant a food forest? Restorative design or ethnobotany? Then stay tuned for Sustainable World Radio. I'm your host and producer, Jill Cloutier. My guest today is Dr. Robin Wall Kimmerer. Robin is a scientist, writer, mother, and distinguished teaching professor of environmental and forest biology at the SUNY College of Environmental Sciences and Forestry. Robin is an enrolled member of the Citizen Potawatomi Nation and founding director of the Center for Native Peoples in the Environment. Her books include Gathering Moss and Braiding Sweetgrass, Indigenous Wisdom, Scientific Knowledge, and the Teachings of Plants. Thank you so much, Robin, for joining me today in this interview. I'm thrilled to have you here. My pleasure. I'm excited to talk with you. I'm reading your book. I'm almost done with Braiding Sweetgrass. And in your book, your land and garden and the plants and animals who live there are some of the main characters. And from your stories, I feel like I can imagine your land, the beautiful sugar maples, your restored spring-fed pond, and all the little tadpoles that you were rescuing as you restored the pond, and your beautiful garden and plants. Can you tell our listeners a bit about your land and where you are in the world? Sure. I live on a small piece of old farmland in uh, upstate New York, near to Syracuse, New York. Um, I, I live in the territory of mm-hmm. the, uh, the ancestral territory of the Onondaga Nation, which is the center of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. I also think that really the best description of where I live is that I, I live in the heart of Maple Nation, mm-hmm. uh, in, the, in the beautiful um, deciduous forests of, of those eastern hills where the leading citizens are sugar maples. Mm-hmm. And um, it just sounds gorgeous. And you decided, I think, at a rather young age to become a botanist. And I'm wondering, as you began your journey, what really drew you into the world of plants? And then what really inspired you once you were kind of enmeshed in the botanical world? You know, Jill, it's, that's actually a really hard question to answer because I can't remember a time when plants were not kind of the center of my universe. Uh, so, you know, I, I had the good fortune of, of growing up in upstate New York in fields and forests and have, um, for from before I can remember, been interested in in plants primarily for oh, the attractiveness of their great beauty and their singularity. I was always fascinated by the fact that each one of them was so distinctive, not only in, in how it looked, but how it smelled and, and what, it, what it gave, um, you know, whether it be berries or flowers or twigs or firewood, all of them different. So it was the particularity of them as individuals that was so compelling for me. Mm-hmm. And I think plants really can cast a spell almost on, <laughs> on us through their many, the way they attract us to them. And my first memory, the very first early memory I have is of in our yard in Alabama and seeing these teeny, and I wish I remembered what the plants were. They were tiny little plants, just the kind of weeds you just walk over and not notice. And I saw tiny little pink kind of lavender flowers. And I remember that feeling of those are my little friends. <laughs> like, there they are. And I didn't think anyone else really noticed, but I would just sit and be with those little plants. And so I definitely can relate to your um, fascination with the plant world. I love how you said that, that you you came to really appreciate them through noticing. And I'd have to say that's one of the things that is um, endlessly fascinating about plants is that that's really all it takes is paying attention. And, and we just stop and just, you know, really open yourself to what's 
around you and your attention is so richly rewarded after these decades of being a botanist i still can't walk outside without being surprised by something and so it's an an endless delight i know some of the happiest people i've met have been plant appreciators botanists people that love plants because everywhere we go there's new things to discover and and um, enjoy ah. <laughs> so you really robin too you have your feet in two worlds you are a scientist and you're an indigenous woman um and the worlds are scientific knowing and classification and then one of indigenous knowing and recognition of connection could you tell us a bit about how you inhabit these worlds and are scientific ways of knowing and indigenous ways of knowing mutually exclusive or incompatible and then I'd love to get into the idea of how do we bring them together to mend our disconnection with the natural world? I know that's kind of a big question. <laughs> well, it is, but it's a question that has really been consuming for me of seeing the world with, with through two different lenses and then trying to reconcile them or at least to understand how they uh, work together and what, what each one provides us. And to answer your question, are scientific and indigenous ways of knowing incompatible? Absolutely not, because it's so important also to remember that science is, is, is a big part of living sustainably well on the land. There was indigenous science here on these shores long before Western science came here, and a lot of it was indigenous plant science. And it's absolutely true that Western science and indigenous science operate from a different set of assumptions about the world. But both of them grow out of curiosity and wonder about the world and trying to discern pattern and understand processes that, that uh, make a world work. So they are both reading from the landscape. So in that way, they have much in common. They're different, though, of course, because in indigenous ways of knowing, I've always been told to think about the medicine wheel, where, among other things on that medicine wheel, we recognize that human beings have, at a minimum, four ways of understanding the world, um, with the intellect or the mind, for sure, with the body, that which we observe and sense, but also emotion as a way of knowing, and spiritual ways of knowing, engaging with that which we can't see, which is bigger than ourselves and sometimes smaller than ourselves. Um, and so in indigenous ways of thinking, we're told to use all of those ways. In Western science, it's truncated, isn't it? In Western science, privileges the intellect above all else and empirical observations the body as well, but but excludes emotion and spirit from our ways of thinking. So there are places of overlap between those ways of knowing and places where uh, indigenous science is, is more holistic than, than Western science. But for me, it's always been a, a, a process of coming to use them together, not to privilege either one of them in such a way that it excludes the other, but to really think about complementarity between them. And I would imagine that that would really affect the way that you teach botany. Inevitably, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. It's like you're dancing in two worlds. And I think, and one thing that I find that's hard is that I feel that often if you if when I have a connection with plants that goes beyond just the classification and the science, that it's hard for me sometimes to message that without sounding very new agey or ungrounded. That's been a challenge. Is that challenging for you teaching? It, it, it can be. I see where you're going with that, that um, in order to, I really try to instill in my students a great respect for the individuality, the integrity, and in a way kind of the sovereignty of, of plant species, which is not to anthropomorphize them, but to respect them for who they are as, as individuals, very different from one another, very different from us. And oftentimes, this notion of anthropomorphism, that we mustn't ascribe human characters to non-human beings, 
fair enough. But that doesn't mean that we exclude the personhood of those beings. It's it's a strawberry personhood, a maple personhood, um, not a human personhood, but still to respect them um, as as persons, as as individuals. I think at this point in history that we really to me, humans were kind of in this lonely and isolated place at the top of the hierarchical heap of um, species. We think we're number one and the most advanced species on the planet. And I'm curious that your book dealt a lot with this is how much does language contribute to our separateness? And in the book, in Braiding Sweetgrass, you write that English doesn't give us many tools for incorporating respect for animacy and that this language of animism is hardly known or spoken in our modern world. Can you explain this to our listeners and tell us a bit about the grammar of animacy? Sure. Um, let me start by saying that I so honor what you just said about this this misperception in a sense that we humans are at the top of a biological hierarchy and and we are different and separate from all other beings and and somehow better more deserving of all of the <laughs> beauty and gifts of the world than than the millions of other species with whom we share the planet usually that's a tip off that you're not if you think that way <laughs> i was saying good call <laughs> <laughs> right, right, um, and and this idea of human exceptionalism that we are different and and better than and above everyone else. Well, for one, it just plain old leads to loneliness um, and and a failure to connect with our relatives, to feel connected to this whole web of of reciprocity ar- around us. So, um, first of all, that we just rethink who we are not that we're masters of the universe but that we are um another member of this democracy of of species we have our own gifts for sure but so do all of those those other beings and as you said it's interesting the way that that human exceptionalism thinking of ourselves as elevated above all others finds its place in the English language. And one of the ways that I think it's really useful to think about that is to remember that the way English is constructed is you are either a human or you're an object. And we have a very particular grammar of respect that we used for each other. Jill, I would never refer to you as it, right? Oh, it's it's doing a wonderful interview. It's <laughs> no, because I stole your personhood. I, I disrespected you. It was incredibly rude to refer to you as 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 an it. And yet, if we were to look out the window at at a at a willow tree or a or a blue jay sitting in that willow tree, we call them it. We disrespect them. We objectify them with that designation as it. And that's just the way English is made. But it has consequences. How we think, how we frame the world certainly colors how we behave. And our Western notions of human exceptionalism by objectifying the world, if we think about rivers and forests as it rather than as as, as beings, that somehow gives us a permission to exploit them. But a difference that I struggled with as I began to learn the Potawatomi language is that it is impossible to it nature in my language. We have to refer to the willow and the blue jay and the river with the same grammar that we use for our human family because they are understood as our family. Uh, that tree is understood as a being, not as an object. And from that, all else follows. A way of treating the world with with respect associated with personhood and uh, the kind of integrity of looking at a world full of beings, not a world full of stuff. It seems to me that the more that we learn about plants and animals, that the smarter or more sentient they seem to become, and that how did science come to this conclusion that plants don't communicate? 
I think a lot of it has to do with anthropocentrism or really zoocentrism, animal centeredness. And if we look at plants and we say, well, they they are lesser because they can't move. And somehow we thought moving was better because we do it, <laughs> because animals do it. Um, this idea that people object to the term of plant cognition or plant neurobiology because their neural networks are not at all like animals. So we we tend to make these conclusions, right? There are these assumptions, really, is if a being is not like us, then it must not have the same capacities that we do. And it it is inevitably a kind of arrogance associated with 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 being human that if they don't have if they don't do it like we do, then probably they don't do it. And it's so exciting now to to realize that we are learning so much about this distributed kind of intelligence that is not housed in a in a brain and a network of nerves, but is is really something very different than what animals do. And so um, I'm just thrilled to be living in a time when these kinds of discoveries about plant sensation and communication are are emerging and to recognize that there's a way in which these scientific discoveries are reinforcing indigenous philosophy about the personhood of, of plants and, and animals. I know, I feel like it's a revolution and we're in a very hard time right now, which it probably always is on this earth, but different countries around the world are recognizing the rights of nature, and that's very exciting. Oh, I agree. I think that the rights of nature and questioning these assumptions about um, justice for all beings and, and standing and and the fact that we we don't have to structure our societies around property rights rather that we can structure our societies around respect for the rights of all beings and uh, and and the personhood of 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 everyone i'm really excited to see where these new systems of jurisprudence might take us it is very exciting and so robin i would love to hear and i know our listeners would too what are some of the more um important and interesting things that you have learned from plants Oh my gosh, do we have hours? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, where to start? One of the things that is a deeply exciting to me is the creativity of plants. That when we look at the vast diversity and variety and local adaptation and Incredible what I think of as botanical ingenuity that has arisen through ev- over evolutionary time the the creative potential is 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 huge, and it gives me a lot of hope for adaptation in a changing world as well that the plants will continue to lead the way with with creative solutions and and this, the whole science of biomimicry, of course, is is grounded in that same understanding of the plants as as creative teachers from from whom we can learn. Another thing that I'm deeply interested in that we have learned from plants has again to do with their otherness something that for a long time the Western world has looked at and said, oh, well, that's a deficiency, Um, by which I mean that they stand still, that plants are rooted, that they can't move around, right? And this has been a source of of many thinking of them as, as, as primitive. But in fact, it is the source, I think, of some of that tremendous creativity that we see in in the evolution of of the plant kingdom because by staying in one place it demands 
different solutions for relationships to to one another. Um, it demands strategies for procuring energy and nutrients that are based oftentimes in things like sharing and and uh, mutualistic networks. I, I I'm really eager to see how we could reframe our thinking when we look at plants as teachers of what it is it like to be rooted in place, to truly belong to a place rather than running away from it. That's lovely. So we were talking earlier about how we're kind of, at, we have placed ourselves at the top of this, um, the top, we're number one, we are the top species. How at this stage and with climate change and planetary upheaval, how can we begin, and I think you touched on it just a minute ago, a second ago, but how do we begin to re-enter the circle? And what are some specific ways that we can mend our, as, as you put it in the book so beautifully, broken relationship with Earth and begin a new one where, quote, people and land are good medicine for each other? Well, one of the first ways that we mend our relationship with, with the Earth is to be present to pay attention, to be astonished, right? Um, We understand that in this country, we really suffer from what eco-psychologists are calling plant blindness, that we don't really even understand as a general pattern their gifts that they bring to us, the remarkable ways that they live their lives. And how do we come to protect them, to rely on them, if we don't even know who they are. So the simple act, and it is simple and profound at the same time, of paying attention to the living world and engaging these remarkable beings around us is, is I think, the first step of, of mending our relationship. But the second part of that is when we do pay attention, we come to know that every single plant, indeed every single being, is a bearer of, of, of gifts in some way, be they hickory nuts or maple syrup or beauty and contemplation, design. All of these plants bring us a gift. And we as human people have to start remembering that these gifts, our our gifts. They're not natural resources. They're not property. They're not things that belong to us. They're they're gifts of of these uh, of these plant persons, if you will. And as people, we know what to do when we're given a gift. We express our gratitude, and then we want to give a gift back. And this idea of healing our relationship with land to remember that people and land can be good medicine for each other is to take an inventory, in a sense, of our own gifts and ask ourselves, not this question that seems to be so pervasive in our economy and in our politics, of what more can we take, but instead asking, what can we give? What could we give back to the earth in response and reciprocity for all of the gifts that the plants have provided us from from oxygen to food and medicine and clothing and you know one could go on but to reconceive of ourselves not just as takers but as givers as well Mm -hmm. and that's ultimately such a more empowering and feels so much better than just because i do feel guilty when i start my car I think, ugh, what am I doing? You know, here I am driving around and I want different alternatives, but I feel like if we can begin to change that relationship with the earth, I think, I'm sure you have this, where some mornings I walk out to my car to go to work and I just look at the birds in my yard and the trees and I think I should just fall on my knees (laughs) in gratitude and it's beautiful. And I feel like the more if all of us could be present in that way, I think society, capitalism might come to a halt. (laughs) But I feel like, yes, but the earth would really, I mean, yeah, it's just a different way of, yes, being and seeing. Uh I so agree. And your, your focus on gratitude is one of those gifts that humans have to give. And that gratitude 
that cultivates connection. Gratitude cultivates humility. It cultivates respect and joy. And one of the other things that we know about gratitude is that when we are no longer anonymous in the world, when we recognize where all these gifts are coming from, from other beings to whom we're we're grateful, um, we then ask, you know, what what do we do in in response? And gratitude seems to be kind of a a mechanism of self-restraint on consumption. Because when you're really grateful, you recognize that you have everything that you need, really. Um, You have everything that you need. And so you don't just consume willy-nilly. It doesn't mean we don't consume because we can't photosynthesize. You know, we're heterotrophs. We have to consume. One of the best dreams I've ever had is in the world, I was surrounded by plants and someone came to me and said, soon you will know how to photosynthesize. <laughs> I was like, oh, yes. oh, wouldn't that be amazing? <laughs> I think so. <laughs> I was so excited when I woke up and then it was like, oh, shoot. <laughs> I know. It's like the ultimate reciprocity, isn't it? You know, to be able to take in CO2, make it into sugar and then give it away. And at the same time, you know, exhale oxygen for all the rest of the world. Um what what an amazing nexus of give and take that that plants um, get to be. Um, we can we can only marvel and 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 be grateful and think about what it is that that we can do to honor and protect such an amazing system. And speaking about honoring, and I feel like one of the things that I've observed is that when. I or a gardener makes space for nature to come in, like in the garden. If we create the space and right conditions for land healing to occur, and I've seen this in my own yard and also on degraded pieces of land, that often land healing does occur and nature responds. I mean, even though I feel like we have come to this place where we're just taking and consuming and looting nature, I feel like nature hasn't shut the door on us completely. And as, as I said in one of the questions I sent you, like nature sees us coming and says, oh, there's that relative I can't stand. Shut the door. I think, <laughs> I think instead that nature really, I mean, do you believe that nature loves us back as love a strange word to use? But what do you, do you think the earth needs humans on some level? It's kind of an awkward question, but it. It is, and isn't it interesting that this is a question that's so fundamental, but we don't usually talk about it. In fact, I, I, I write about that in Breeding Sweetgrass of, of my students who all profess to love the earth so much. And then when I ask them, do you think the earth loves you back? Is there reciprocity in that? They have a real hard time with that, with that question. Um, and I answer it, yes. I, I do think the the earth loves us back in terms of the gifts that are continually provided for us, she has not turned her back on us, uh, despite many of our uh, of our failings of of our our assault, and and we have to think about that. You know this this generosity that is shown to us by the earth, and how do we reciprocate that generosity? The question, though, of does earth need us? is is a different question and and i've given a a lot of thought to that um need when we sort of boil that down to some function what is it that human beings do that can be beneficial for the rest of of the living world um i think there are lots of things and it's really important that we come to know those and search for those because if we feel ourselves to be only in a sense of a, a parasite or something, uh, only a, a, a consumer, um, that puts us into this death spiral of endless exploitation. Um, if we have to conceive of ourselves again as, 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 as givers, as, as, as I've said, and one of the things that human beings are particularly good at, I think, is that we are edge makers. Wherever we 
go through the natural world, we, through our activities, tend to make edges, disturbances, if you will, um, to the status quo of established plant communities. We make edges of forest. We use fire to change the landscape by making edges. And ecologically, that is something that, that our species is is, um, is is prone to do. And those edges can be uh, very biodiverse. We know that these edges, or as ecologists call them, ecotones, are some of the sites of highest biodiversity and productivity. And so there's a way in which those beings that flourish at the edge are are um, indebted in a way to to humankind who create those edges. It's not that we're the only species that do that, but we do it really well. What we have to think about, of course, is finding balance in that. That to use to to think of the way that we alter landscapes in such a way that aid biodiversity um, and not alter landscapes in such a way that that uh, uh, prevent it or diminish it. So really that brings us to the idea of ecological literacy and how important that is. And um, you write in the book, in Braiding Sweetgrass, that you were raised by strawberries and that these berries first shaped your view of a world of gifts simply scattered at your feet. And I think that's so beautiful. And I feel like many children and adults and politicians, I might add, <laughs> um, have no, don't, don't get to spend time in nature and they also don't learn about it in schools. Do you have any ideas on that, the importance of ecological literacy, and also how, if we had a basic understanding of this, it might change the world? Yeah, um, so true in in many dimensions that when we fail to um, really engage with the world and understand how the world works, that reinforces human exceptionalism because all we see is the built environment. We're, we're not engaged in the evolving, dynamic, uh, more than human uh, in, environment. And that leads to, as you know, what has been referred to as things like nature deficit disorder, uh, health consequences, sensory deficits, um, that, that our, our capacity to fully use all of our human gifts are in some way dependent on, on the complexity and dynamism of, of being in, in the embrace of, of, of nature, uh, for sure. Um, so I think that as a to reconnect with with the living world is to know ourselves more fully as as humans and to experience the companionship of of other species and um, i I think it must be really lonely to go through the world not knowing who your plant neighbors are it's said that that the average American knows fewer than ten plants, and you know you think how do you how do you feel at home when you don't know the ones around you who might provide you food or or or, or medicine or or shade or are building your soil you, it just would feel really lonely and um, so the coming to know plants by being immersed in in the world is is i think vital to human well-being and that really makes me think that a wonderful job for all of us is re-greening our cities so people can have those relationships. Absolutely. And and to think again, you know, that we often think, oh, well, nature is someplace over there, right? You know, it's, it's, it's far away. Well, nature is all around us. We are nature. And, uh, and we just, it's really just a matter of opening our eyes to, to that um, connection. Lately, just in the world, it seems like we're in a time of upheaval. And I wanted you to touch briefly on the idea of the honorable harvest. And it seems like a wonderful antidote for our current time and the way that we're just going through resources so quickly. And if you could just tell our listeners a bit about that, and then how would our lives change if this was a more common practice to follow? Sure. Um, 
this idea of the honorable harvest is based in all the things that we have been talking about so far. This idea of respect for individuals in the living world as persons, that we don't eat them, we call them by name, we recognize them as our family. But that sets up an ethical dilemma, doesn't it? Because that means we're going to be eating our family, (laughs) right, (laughs) basically. And so if in the Western world where we just say, well, it's it, it's not our family, it's just stuff, it's property, it belongs to us, we can deal with it any way we want. But when we recognize the personhood of all beings, it means that as we consume, as we have to consume, um, we do it with honor and we do it with mindfulness of how we take from the living world. And these protocols for how we take from the living world are part of every indigenous and land-based local culture that I know. That there are guidelines of self-restraint for how we take from the world. And the honorable harvest includes the notion of never take the first one. You stop and reflect on the nature of this gift that's being offered you. Not stuff, not property, but a gift that's being given to you. And you don't take the first one. You demur and go on to be sure that there's three or four or more or a hundred that you don't take until you know that there's enough to share. And we always say that the honorable harvest includes asking permission asking permission of that tree or those berries or those roots that uh, could you share those with me to engage those plants as 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 beings as 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 persons and then really evaluating listening for the answer if you ask is there enough to share could i have some of that you then have to use your human gifts to hear that answer and they might be science gifts they might be a way of, of of judging the size of that population, measuring its viability, its vigor, to know whether there's enough to share, reading the landscape. It could also be intuitive gifts and spiritual gifts to be able to listen to the answer, to say, yeah, is it okay if I take these? And if the answer is no, then you just don't take them. We also say that the honorable harvest is, again, self-restraint. You never take more than half, and the prescription is that you take only what you need. Take as little as, as you can to, to meet your needs. So different than the dominant paradigm of <laughs> be efficient, take everything that you can get at the, at the least possible cost. The honorable harvest continues, don't waste what you've taken. Share everything that you've taken minimize harm in the way that you take, offer gratitude for what you've received, and then most importantly, to reciprocate the gift. In return for what we've been given, give something back. And this is both a spiritual practice and a material practice, which are rooted firmly, honestly, in the laws of thermodynamics. You can't just keep taking without replenishing. That's not how the world works. And so these are some of the elements of the of the honorable harvest, which are these ancient protocols that lead to this idea that if we sustain the living world by the honorable harvest, the living world can continue to sustain us. It's hmm. wonderful. And we find ourselves now because we have just been taking, you know, with some giving, but a lot of taking. And I feel like we're at this point now um, with climate change, our crisis with climate change. Um, do you believe that plants hold particular lessons for us in this era of climate change? And do they hold a key up to a possible solution to climate change through photosynthesis? Oh, absolutely. I think they do. Um, You know, when we hear about um, all of these solutions for carbon sequestration and coming up with, (laughs) you know, technological solutions to do that, um, I, I don't want to be dismissive of technological innovation. But honestly, that alone is not going to get us where we need to be. It's got to be, we can't just metaphorically change light bulbs. We have to change ourselves 
as well um, and our in our worldview and our understanding of our our place in the world and the good thing is we've got plants to teach us that when you think about the biomimicry of what plants have to teach us about dealing with accelerating climate chaos you just look at them and, and realize that they have already converted to a hundred percent solar economy right Mm -hmm. Um, There they are, um, creating food, medicine, fuel, all of these things on a solar economy in great, great um, diversity, Um, that they build soil rather than deplete it. They filter water. They, you know, they sequester carbon. They store it. They make beauty. Um, they, They cool us down. Plants make it rain by interacting in this reciprocal way with the hydrologic cycle. So, yeah, I think we have some pretty good teachers out there of how we might adapt to to climate change by looking at how the plants do it, that we need to invest as much in protecting the flourishing of plants and increasing the flourishing of plants as we do with our technological solutions. Mm -hmm. I do also have to say, though, that reforestation, investment in, in both in forest, in the carbon sequestration that's possible in good, rich, fertile soils, for example, these things that are taught us by plants, some of the climate models do tell us, though, that, that reforestation and investment in plants is a big part of where we need to go, but that it isn't enough. We have so created this surplus of, of, of carbon dioxide inputs without carbon dioxide absorption by natural communities that we're going to need other solutions as well, which include, of course, um, uh, reduced consumption, reduced production of, of, of carbon dioxide through a, a transition to renewable energy. And that's where I could see how the marriage of science, science technology and indigenous wisdom, it really can come together and come up with solutions. Absolutely. And so we're getting close to the end of our time um, together. And one question I had was, how can we honor the people and cultures that have so much to teach us about how to live lightly and lovingly on the planet? And how can we apply indigenous ecological knowledge in a respectful way without participating in cultural appropriation? such an important question um, and I thank you for, for asking that. One of the things which is so important is to recognize that our connections to the earth come from paying attention to the earth and participating in, in the cycles of, of living, right? And to recognize that the earth feeds all of us. And and where I'm going with this is to try and remember that while indigenous societies provide us with models and inspiration of how we might live, that our job is not to be borrowing or appropriating from native cultures, but in fact to come with authentic relationships to our own places in a cultural context which is meaningful to the practitioner, to you. Um, I think it's so important that we live with honor, with gratitude, with reciprocity, with reverence. Um, And we do that by creating authentic relationships with, with the land ourselves. That is at root most meaningful, to really come to inhabit our home places, whether they be in the midst of a city or in the desert or in the mountains, you know, to live deliberately, right? To live as if our grandparents' ashes were in that land, Um, to live as if this is the place where our descendants will or will not flourish, to live as if that river is going to be our life source from these days forward. Um, 
And it's that authentic engagement with place and participation in the reciprocal exchanges with your place that allow us to live lovingly and lightly, as you as you said so beautifully, without cultural appropriation, but with creation of authentic relationship. So Robin, if people um, want to know more about you and your writings and work, where can they find um, you online? <laughs> That's a really good question. And um, I guess the answer that I have to say is that the digital world is really not my natural habitat. <laughs> so I do not have much of a, what I would call an organized presence online, aside from like a Facebook page about braiding sweetgrass. Um, that being said, there are um, many videos of talks that I give and have, have given um, available and uh, but I I don't I actually don't have a website or anything I know pretty wild isn't it no one of my friends he's a very famous aromatherapist he doesn't have a website either <laughs> oh good there's yeah. one other person in the world <laughs> he said I don't people will find me who need to find me and they do it's amazing he's so busy yes yeah exactly exactly so Robin is there anything else you would like to share with our listeners today I don't think so. You know, I did have on written down here that I wanted to be sure to talk about rights of nature because it wasn't in our question list, but you but you added it spontaneously. So, <laughs> nope, that we've gotten to talk about that. So, I think that's good. Perfect. Well, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure to speak with you. Thank you for everything that you do in awakening people to these connections. We are all in this together and it's a good thing we need us all. Right? Oh, it's great. Thank you. And your voice is so beautiful. Have people told you that many times probably? <laughs> so they tell me. <laughs> yes, it's just it, it's very like soothing and calming and I could just feel myself riding the waves and it's wonderful for storytelling. So your gifts definitely you came into the world with the gifts you needed to impart your message. Oh, miigwech. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And, and you as well. All right. Okay. Bye-bye, Jill. Bye-bye. You've been listening to a Sustainable World Radio podcast. You can find us online at sustainableworldradio.com and also on iTunes. For more information about permaculture and ecology, visit the Sustainable World Media YouTube channel, where you'll find videos about permaculture, aquaponics, organic gardening, rainwater harvesting, and much, much more. Sustainable World Radio is a listener-supported program. If you like what we do, please consider making a donation to the show. I'm your host and producer, Jill Cloutier, and thank you so much for listening. Mm-hmm.